I didn't know any better, I would say this one's going to go all the way. None of this eight second stuff like yesterday. <laughs> See you guys in the chat. Thanks for sticking around. Looks like whatever streaming issues YouTube had last time wasn't quite working. Ooh, I just realized that's the wrong thumbnail. Let's make it proper. There we are. Episode four, persi Persistence. Look, this one's awesome. You're going to love it. Oh, I love the fade too. As you can see, we're playing with the color correction here. Give you guys a little bit of visual interest for these things. Anyways, welcome back. When I say no, I feel guilty. Dr. Manuel Smith, the counterpart to when I say no, I or counterpart to no more Mr. Nice Guy by Dr. Robert Glover. Awesome guy. Anyways, I guess getting started. I've also added, as you can see right now, the hard covers, covers of my book are out. You can see, oh, right there. Feel free, check it out. Links in the description. Like I said, Jordan Peterson made you pay $24 for 12 rules to life. I added three more rules and charged $15 less. So it's great, great bang for your buck. You'll laugh, you'll cry, you'll cringe, and you'll see some of your own successes and failures in mind. Because let's face it, most guys are about the same. But let's cut right to it. I see in the chat, somebody named Stardusk. No, don't know, don't care. Um, we're busy. So we're busy fixing problems. We're busy unscrewing up men's lives and we are busy teaching guys how to use better strategies in the sexual marketplace so from a relationship standpoint and this one it's not just relationships this kind of matters just for like it codes for general humanity like one thing you'll notice if i talked about the last episode at least i'm pretty sure i did i had to repeat it four times because of youtube issues was that a lot of this stuff while the assertiveness training is a good thing it codes almost too simply for man. It kind of codes for the human condition. And a lot of the times when guys are missing these assertive traits, it's kind of like a bit of their humanity is taken away. So part of this is that using these strategies to become less unattractive over time actually helps build, you know, a little bit of humanity in you so you're less of an NPC. Not saying you guys are, I'm just talking. <laughs> hey, what's up, guys? All right cutting back to it here so the first thing to learn in being assertive is persistence and this is this is something that a lot of guys kind of learn the hard way they'll come into for example like the married red pill and they'll be told about sidebar books they give their one victim puke talking about how crappy their wife is and how they're putting up with it and the guys will sit there and call them a bundle of sticks and all kinds of random nonsense they read through the nice guy activities. It blows their mind how well it codes to them in their life. Then they get into when I say no, I feel guilty. And they're like, yeah, I don't get it. I started using these things and nobody cares. So to preface the chapter before we even get started, I often, and I'm going to use the, the analogy here of boundary enforcement. So when you're enforcing a boundary, you only have three tools right now, especially when it comes to women. You have your attention, your affection, and your commitment. You have to pull them commensurate with whatever boundary they've crossed. If you're a single guy and it's a Twitch thought wanting money and berating you for that, well, you pull your attention. If it's a girl that you've been casually dating for a couple weeks now, and then she does something stupid like sleep with your brother, well, then you pull your commitment. If it's a wife of 10 years and she's got two kids and she's weaponizing you and threatened divorce, well, sometimes it's just an easy matter of pulling your affection and pulling your attention. Now, what I talked about before, was a lot of guys are like, I don't get it. She didn't care. Well, that's because these tools really only have teeth to them if you have a high SMV or sexual market value. Basically, people respect the boundaries of attractive people. I don't just mean physically attractive because you can be ugly in the soul too. <laughs> so it's more than just... I should I'm not really listening to anything. Why am I even putting these in? It's more than just being attractive as in like the solid jawline, physically fit, all that crap. A lot of this removing your unattractive parts here really weighs into it. While they may not make you attractive enough to be able to pick up any girl you want at any time, they are going to prevent you from sabotaging yourself, whether it's a girl you just meet at the bar, you just meet at a coffee house, you've been in a relationship for a month, or even married for a year or longer. That's kind of the point of all this stuff. And after digesting all of the material about your assertive human rights, 
You may find yourself in a position of a learner who said, I've secretly felt this way about myself and other people all my life, but whenever I expressed it, I was always told that way of thinking was wrong, that I shouldn't feel that way, and I'm glad that other people think I have a right to my own thoughts and ways of doing things. So this one, I think it codes to men more so because like when I was a kid, there were still places for guys to talk about guy things. It's, there was television shows, there was entertainment, there was literature. There were still like masculine writers, masculine cartoons, say what you will about G.I. Joe, but it was definitely like masculine themed honor and courage and lasers and yeah, here's a good message, eat your Wheaties. And that stuff's kind of gone now for multiple reasons. Part of it is the institutions that were, were tasked with curating them have been infested in various ways by, you know, female empowerment. And it's not, and here's the thing, it wasn't even an evil thing. It was just, you know, as you're going up, you're growing up and yeah, women and men are basically good people. So why wouldn't you bring girls in on this locker room? And then they bring a girl in. And if you've read it before, there's a post called Welcome to the Sandbox, or uh, yeah, the Sandbox, the Male Social Matrix. And they talk about these male social structures and how they're designed. Essentially, initial fitness testing and then wholehearted acceptance. Think of it like the military. You go through basic training, and as long as you pass, you're in the military. Unless you do something especially egregious, in which case they'll kick you out. But for the most part, it's like internal conflicts are handled internally. Women don't do that. Again, Ian Ironwood, same post, flip side. He call it swing sets, the side of solipsism, or the female social matrix, which is initial wholehearted acceptance and then constant undermining and uh, drama. Twitch, great example of that. If you watch a lot of those co-ed spaces, the girls are essentially undermining everybody. I think Rolo just had a tweet where he described how um, there's a whisper network in the comics industry, which has been typically a male industry for, you know, 80 some years. Turns out a couple girls ended up in it. They created their own little uh, click within it, and they use that to undermine people on the outside for gain on their own. It's just the way it works. Guys have a physicality to them that has us think of violence as, as our way of solving problems. Women don't have that, so they tend to be very cunning and Machiavellian. Now, because we're a civilized society, obviously that's the stuff that's, it's not only legal to do, but it's almost encouraged. So unfortunately, in the modern life, we have to kind of understand that bit of female nature and either learn to thrive with it or learn to adopt it to our own sensibilities. But back to the topic. So a significant part of this ability in our assertive behave, verbal behavior is what do we do when we assert ourselves? Just talking about our assertive rights is insufficient to enforce them. That your assertive rights exist, that you accept them as part of yourself, does not mean that other people will either respect or understand them or change their manipulative behavior. How can she slap, basically? Looking in, you're going to develop a strategy here, and it's a very simple one. It's called broken record, and we're going to talk about that a bit. But let me make sure there's no reading before I get into that part. Okay, here. So enforcing your assertive rights and to halt the manipulation of your behavior, you seed to change your own behavior in response to manipulation, the behavior that allows you to be manipulated. So I've already talked about boundary enforcement, which is exactly what that is, changing your own behavior in response to manipulation. And simply put, if you could sum all of this up, it's that your time, your attention, your commitment, your engagement, those are all contingent on somebody else being more valuable to you than some alternative. It's in economic terms, they call it opportunity cost. And you're just applying this to other people. If a girl's wasting your time, well, you don't waste your time on her. You don't simp for a girl that's trying to friend zone you, in other words. Before I get started on broken record, or maybe after, actually no, we're gonna go through the broken record part first. So what is broken record? Um, for those of you who may be Zoomers and have never heard what the hell a record is before, which I doubt because, I mean, Macintosh Plus just came out on vinyl, so I'm pretty sure there's a bunch of audio files out there. Um, oftentimes, guys lose these manipulative games because you give up too easily. So, but I can't do that. I can't ignore somebody when he tells me no. My response, what do you mean you can't? I don't see any handcuffs or a ball and chain that keeps you from doing anything. I'll respect that you don't want to, but I won't respect that you can't. This goes both ways. If you're unable to enforce your own boundaries, it's not that you can't enforce them, it's that you won't. And I know 
it's that personal responsibility thing, which everybody loves talking about. Oh, I'm personally responsible, extreme ownership. Funnily enough, once you map it to like actual situations, it's surprising how much of it is just people LARPing and not actually following through on what they preach. So when you say, I can't get this, I can't do that, I can't get her to love me, I can't, you know, I can't break my dead bedroom, I can't leave her and the kids, there's not can't. There's nothing physically stopping from you. And in fact, the way the, way the legality of defeat, de, de losing or disillusioning in a relationship goes, it's never been easier. You could have five kids, a wife of 15 years, and then just get up and leave one day. And the only legal ramifications of that are the separation of assets that come through. So it's not even a, it's not even a legal hurdle. It's a logistical hurdle. So part of this goes, now this is going to be a little bit of a tangent, but I'm getting back to it. So if you're in the case that you're leaving a relationship, well, then you just have to take stock with what, what can you get away with? What can you not get away with? What do you have to learn to leave? How much effort are you willing to put in to minimize your uh, exposure, I guess? So from a marriage, I mean, there's an easy thing to do there. Um, if you know the way uh, divorce law is set up in your area, then let's say it's just like a calculation that this assets will be split up this way, regardless of who did what and when. Doesn't matter who cheated, doesn't matter who left, doesn't matter if there's kids, whatever. You look at that pot and you're like, okay, so I see this and what's left? You do some mental math. Okay, so how do I live with this much? And then you do what you can to get that to a state where you can live with the worst case scenario. At that point, you're free to make any decision you want. So there's no can't involved. When it comes to enforcing your boundaries, when it comes to being assertive, sometimes just saying, I'm out of here and going out to get a pack of smokes and not coming back. It becomes as easy as the logistical confidence in knowing that whatever has happened, you've taken a look into what the uh, consequences are and you can live with them. Easy as that. Sometimes there's child support payments. Again, those are becoming for the most part uh, standardized, especially among like, Ontario is a little bar behind, but I know a lot of the states have essentially switched to saving the court's time and all these arguments that they're like, look, punch their incomes into the formula. There's child support payments based on custody. And a lot of guys find, and they usually find it after the fact, because most guys don't actually research this stuff when they're with somebody that they like, because they think, well, why would I jinx it by looking into what separation is like? But then by the time she leaves, it's too late. But taking a proactive stance on this, a lot of guys find and even in reactively, they find out afterwards that even though they're paying all this money in child support or alimony or losing their assets, they tend to have more disposable income. So it's a weird thing that cheaper to keeper thing doesn't exist. But we're going to get back to broken record now. So there's no such thing as can't. There's only won't. The technique was developed by uh, one of his colleagues, Dr. Zev Wanderer, he calls it broken record. So keep saying what we want to say and ignore all side issues brought up by the person we assert ourselves to. In using broken record, you, the learner, are not deterred by anything the other person may say, but keep saying it in a calm, repetitive voice what you want to say until the other person ascends or accedes to your request or agrees to a compromise. Now there's going to be a lot of caveats in this and that's going to be the majority of the episode because this is a fairly short chapter. Broken record... In this case, now he underlines like calm, repetitive voice. And I would argue most of the time when a guy gives me a field report and he talks about, I just calmly stated, and they always add that adjective in there. The one thing you can take as a truism is that they definitely were not calm. Their body language betrayed their lack of calmness. And this is a, a way of them coping afterwards with their inexperience with asserting boundaries. So I have a post actually on my old blog and I gotta, I gotta update it. It's called, she already knows you were an F. So what did you expect? Or she already knows you're going to be butthurt or butt mad. And this is one of the common times when you start to engage people and tell them like, bro, it's now it's time for broken record. Well, they go, well, won't she think I'm butthurt? Or won't she think I'm butt mad? Or won't she think I'm crying or a big baby? It's like, if you're at the point where you have to learn from a bunch of guys on the internet about enforcing the boundaries and being more attractive, <laughs> she already thinks that so you can just you don't have to worry about it. don't cry over spilled milk so now that you know she already thinks you're a schlub and even if you're not she thinks you are so what are you going to do basically broken record just repeat yourself you don't want to get emotional about it when they say like be calm and repetitive all they're saying is that don't end up screaming like a little child because that's a lack of control thing. The idea is you want to have control over your own emotions. 
you're allowed to be angry. Like we said before, you're allowed to be illogical. You're allowed to change your mind. We've heard all of this stuff before in the last two episodes. So since you're already allowed to be all this stuff, then there's no reason to uh, emote about it. It's just the law of the universe. And it, instead of acting calm, it actually makes you calm because it's just the way it is. Just keep repeating yourself. Well, you did this and you did this and you did that. And that's usually how these conversations go with assertive, manipulative people and non-assertive, passive people. Is that the instant you bring up any grievance, the other person will try and change the subject to make it so that way you equally have some grievance and you can just swap them out. Nothing changes. If you're bad and I'm bad, then nobody's really bad. These are tangents. These are deflective tactics. And if you go back to the No More Mr. Nice Guy series, I talk a lot about this Teflon man. This is Teflon man applied to somebody else. So you're actually receiving nice guy behaviors back, which again, not cool. And you can see why it's unattractive when you do it. So the idea of here is just staying on point, stay in the box. I mean, Bill Burr, he had a great sketch on this where he talks about arguments and how girls argue. And he goes, you know, if you have an argument and she's right and she sticks to the point and she's in that pocket, I can totally respect that. But when you're right and she's wrong, they go rogue. They can cock this whole crazy story just to get you to call him a C word. And then nothing else matters. That's exactly what he's talking about here. It's, it's a great bit and I totally butchered it, but whatever, I'm not a comedian. The point is you have to ignore all this outside stuff. You have to ignore these deflections. You ignore the Teflon approach. You ignore everything. If there's something you need to assert on your own, we use an example here of like a girl's night out because that's one, a common one for guys. The idea being a girl who's no longer seeing her man as her best option will check out of a marriage or check out of a relationship, but she doesn't like being alone either. So for six months, she kind of pulls her attraction. She pulls her attention. She starts making herself attractive again, losing weight, dressing sexier, putting herself out there more so she can find somebody else and branch swing. Usually what happens at some point is the girl will out of nowhere as a complete change of behavior, want to have a girl's night out with her girls. Rollo has a great article on this one too, where it's one of those, and it's another thing that we've stolen from transactional analysis. It's a double bind because if you say no, then you're a controlling beast and that gives her an excuse to go find somebody else because you're heart, heart, horrible, horrible. And if you say yes, well, then she gets to go out and have her fun and hopefully land herself a new man. You know, it just happened. So in general, the only way to play this one is to not to play just broken record. Yeah, I don't date girls who do girls night outs with that slut Cindy. I just don't. And he, that's the key to this is you're doing broken record. But in this specific example, you're not telling her what to do. That just creates conflict unnecessarily. And this is what's going to get into my whole uh, caveat with the broken record. You're not telling her what to do. Uh, don't go out there. You can't go out with your friend. She's a slut. Girl's going to say, you can't tell me what to do. Screw you. And she goes out anyway. And you're that controlling ass. And now she needs glad to be rid of you as an abuser. Instead, I don't date girls who do that. Or, you know, have fun with the understanding that she goes out to do this stuff. Well, that you've made this boundary. And if she crosses it, you enforce it. In this case, if you're done and you're like, all right, have fun. She decides to cross that boundary. Well, you enforce it. You pull your commitment. That is what you, that is essentially what you established is that that's a boundary for you. What I would suggest then for guys doing broken record. And the reason, one of the reasons they have a lot of failure on this is because they aren't prepared to enforce their boundaries. They use broken record. It's kind of like a LARPing tool. I don't think that's a good idea. What do you mean? Blah, blah, blah. You're just an abuser, blah, blah. I don't think that's a good idea. Blah, 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 blah. Yeah, I don't date girls that do that. And you just keep, that's on the point. I don't like the idea of being in a relationship with a girl that's going to go out with her slutty friends to the bar. You repeat it, you repeat it, repeat it. Broken record, very assertive. You asserted yourself. She gets mad in a huff, goes out. Well, that's why broken record didn't work because you weren't prepared to enforce it or you didn't have the ape ability to. Now, that's one example. There's going to be a hundred different examples that this comes up. The one thing to keep in mind is the time to use broken record and the time to enforce boundaries and become assertive are times when you can actually enforce the consequences. Sometimes you just have to take an L. And I think he gets into that later on here. Yeah, yeah, some supermarket clerk story. It's kind of ridiculous, whatever. Supermarket clerk. Do those even exist anymore? Holy cow, he had a lot of them. There it is. 
So it's not very realistic to be assertive in some situations. In situations where you have little control on what is going to happen, it is foolish and possibly dangerous, unless you're a trained professional, to assert yourself in the systematic manner outlined in this text. The situations where you have to limit your assertiveness are those that involve legal and physical factors. Like not all members of our federal, state, county, and municipal judiciary or law enforcement are assertive themselves. Some of these professions, unfortunately, cloak their own personal bias on how people should behave with their robes of office and have real, if not absolute, legal authority to act out on their personal feelings. Again, end of last episode, we talked about hypothetical versus categorical imperatives. Now, from a relationship standpoint, from interpersonal standpoint, that's easy. Very unstructured environment, and you're able to assert yourself as you see fit. But if you remember, we talked about the three different types of engagement. So the first one was, I think it was called formal. And then the second one was authority. And then the third one was interpersonal. I probably got the names mixed up, but it's generally the categories. So formal ones, like with your boss, obviously there's a structure put in place and you have to play by it. You can use broken record, but at the end of the day, the best you're going to be able to do is walk away. Because that's really the only boundary you have from a workplace environment and then there's the understanding that it costs a lot to replace you and you may have expertise that's hard to find you may be at a discount compared to what other people in the industry are using the point is you have just as much leeway as it costs to replace you so with this broken record you really have to pick the proper battles additionally sometimes it's just a pain in the ass to replace somebody and they don't want to do it you're a good fit you having the options to go to another place like you have an offer in hand gives you leverage to act stronger with your boundaries because you not only know the consequences, but in some cases they may end up being better. A company wants you for 20 grand more a year. Well, at that point, what boundaries do you have to enforce? I, oh, I love this. It's a, my favorite example. So in the military, when I first joined, the uh, main engagement would give you, you had 20 years of service. And then after that, they called it the 2020-20 uh, rule. So after 20 years of service, uh, 20 seconds to piss me off, 20 days I'm out of there. And you would watch. These guys had a level of autonomy that's unheard of in the military because they could literally just retire anytime they want to. There was no incentive for them to stay. There's no contractual obligations. There's nothing. And so when you watch these guys, and even when they retire and they start working in the workplace, like they got a pension, they don't care. They're probably, if you can ever find a veteran, like a recently retired veteran with a full pension, they're going to be some of the strongest people that you can learn boundary enforcement from and broken record stuff. It's just absolutely amazing. But to get back to the point on times when this stuff is and is not applicable, when you can use broken record effectively and when you really are just, I don't know, LARPing, I guess, for lack of a better word. Two concepts, stuff we learned in the military as well, soft power and hard power. Hard power is authority. So in the case of, and in the case of the modern relationships, women have a lot of hard power. They just have to, I mean, the way, for example, domestic violence laws have been set up, all they have to do is an accusation. And then for the safety of the women, you're automatically removed, restraining orders put on, and they'll sort it out after the fact. You remember what I talked before about the article threat point and how there is a cooling effect? So understanding here that that hard power exists obviously puts a, it puts a certain onus on you to understand the situations where you do have the ability to influence from a hard power standpoint in those times when you don't. Arguably, most times you don't. Most of the times, like they said, the women got it pretty good right now, and that's fine. What we do have, though, in abundance is soft power. So soft power is what you would think of as persuasion, as incentives, everything that... Actually, a good way to think of it is the difference between leading and managing. I'm sure you guys have all seen that meme where manager is standing behind people with a whip, and the leader is the one standing in front pulling the cart with them. It's essentially like that. Hypergamy, in this case, actually works in our best interests. So when you're, when you're a girl's best option, when you're a top tier man, top 20%, whatever you want to refer to it as, basically when you're worth a damn, people actually treat losing you like a punishment. Very risky. No, no girl wants to leave somebody who's at the top of his game. They just don't. That's why so many marriages never get past the passive dread stage where a guy just makes himself more attractive and sheds some unattractive behaviors that we're talking about here. Because 
there's something that a girl can use for social cred. Like I said, everything is based on her ego. Now she can she can leave a man who was socially frowned upon. Oh, he was just some creep. He was kind of creepy. Oh, he did this. He did that. He's a beta male. Whatever. However they word it, that stuff's a story that a girl can live with. But you left him. That's probably dead ass the most terrifying thing a girl will hear in her whole life. You left that guy. As in, like, are you stupid? Girls will put up with all kinds of nonsense if it's considered like a socially, like a social status marker to be with you in a relationship. And that's why status matters so much. Other people wanting what she's got actually makes her want what she has even more. And that's that's how pre-selection works. It's a very strong thing. So I don't want to minimize how much being attractive and being high status as possible will help you mitigate those hard powers that the girls have. And this is where this is where MGTOWs and red pill guys for the most part have a giant disagreement. And the MRAs and all the other guys, all the other crappy guys, they will sit there and say, don't do anything with women because they have this power and this power and this power and you're wrong and you're dead and they can nuke you in a heartbeat. And yes, they can. But the beauty of it is, they only do that, to, they only bully the soft targets. Again, I'll reference uh, Dutton's work, Wisdom of Psychopaths, when I talked about how he had an interview with a bunch of psychopaths, he showed them videos of people walking down the street, asked them which one of these ones would you mug, they all said the same people because they could just see the soft targets. It is amazing and I cannot understate how important it is to have status and attractiveness and frame and strong boundaries and how all of these things make it way less likely for the stuff to be weaponized against you. Now, that's not to say that's a case for marriage because, I mean, not being screwed over isn't an incentive for that. But you're eventually going to be in some sort of relationship with another girl. I mean, I don't care if you're a playboy. One night stands are still eight hour relationships. Which I think in the Muslim world, they actually marry you for eight hours and then they uh, divorce you right afterwards. But anyways, the point is you're going to, as long as you're engaged with the human race, these interactions are going to come up. And so it's best to put yourself on a strong footing to begin with. You don't have to be the shape built like the rock, as rich as Donald Trump with as much power as the president, like none of that stuff. A lot of the times just being the best, best damn manager at Best Buy who wasn't fat, sometimes stuff like that is enough. Like you gotta look to your social, your social uh, matrix. Who's around you? Who's your social circles? Being top 20% in those is sometimes all it takes. And if you're in crappier circles, well, then it's much easier. If you're in multiple circles, then all you have to do is be top 20% in the ones that matter to you most. And luckily enough, the things we're good at are the stuff that tends to matter to us. So that gets soft and hard power out of the way. So obviously, if you're going to try asserting boundaries with the cops, not the place to do it. I mean, I know this is a contentious issue right now, but the time to assert your rights with the cops is at the court hearing. If they decide that you're breaking a law, then there's really no power you have in that situation. You can't really make your case because they've already, all they're doing is looking, they already have the suspicion and they're looking for the reason to arrest you and charge you. So you keep your mouth shut, you don't say anything. See this, this is more than just about sleeping with girls. And at the same time, then time to assert your boundaries with the lawyer at the law at the court case. Let's say something especially egregious happened. There's damages happening. There's You can sue. If you'll notice, a lot of these guys, like the dude that uh, got accused by Mattress Girl, that Rolling Stone article about how the guy was got Title IX, completely expelled, his life basically ruined. He won a lawsuit, multi-million dollar. You want to talk about college being an investment? Well, just have a girl accuse you of something and then uh, sue her afterwards and you're set for life. Awesome. It's a, it's a horrible place to be. Like, I don't want to make light of it either because, I mean, I've been on the other end of like, investigations. It's not a pretty thing. It's not a good sight. But if you're already going through that much pain, you better make sure you get yours out of it. And that's kind of where I'm going with this. Pick your battles. Again, a second one, huge that guys do this with is they try to out alpha the divorce courts process and you don't. There's a reason that in the Married Red Pill, we call it the Better Betas Divorce Guide. This is one of those tactical retreat things. If you go in there with bravado, if you go in there trying to be the biggest alpha that ever alpha, if you try acting like, you know, a digital pimp in there, you're going to get slapped down because you don't have that hard power. So a lot of times what you do is you actually, on purpose, 
de-emphasize your boundaries and assertiveness because you want to look like a soft target so that way when you do have the law on your side, the law is generally impartial. How we approach it may not be impartial to start with, but the laws apply to everybody. If you're able to come at this from that perspective, then once you can actually have a monetary or substantial legal gain from it, that's when you do your assertiveness and the law ends up being that force behind you that allows it to happen. Military, great example. Uh, East Coast, not so much. It was kind of more feminized this way, but the West Coast, you would get in an argument with the chief and this is this is how you were like trained to have this tactical assertiveness. You got into an argument with the chief or an officer and they tell you to do something and you know it's the wrong thing to do. You mention it once, they still say it. Okay, all right, yes, sir, gonna get back on it. So you go back, grab the references, grab the policies, grab the ship standing orders, grab whatever legal documentation you have that shows that it's either against policy or an illegal thing to do. You bring it back, you're like, yes, it can't be done. This section, this thing here, sorry, sir. And then that's it, that's it. That's it tactical enforcement of boundaries and you can repeat it as much as you want now here's the thing if that guy still pushes tries to get his personality going through there i'll charge you you little bastard and blah 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 well you know see so you at the summary trial sir as you say you don't do it they bring you to the summary trial you bring up how you were following the law and legally you're obliged to disobey illegal orders so if you have and the beauty of things like ship standing orders at the time those are ones that are orders signed by the captain. So if you go against those, you're essentially going against the captain's orders. So when somebody orders you something that's against it, you end up having the equivalent of saying, are you telling me I should disobey him? And those captains tend not to look kindly upon it, which is why the situation never comes up because of that process. So do try to be mindful of who has the authority in the situation, where the soft power points are, where the hard power points are, and be very tactical on boundary assertion and use them when you can achieve something. At the end, a lot of guys talk about uh, what's in it for me. And a lot of guys can't answer that. They just wanna win some weird battle. Like I just wanna beat the bitch in this and establish a boundary and do broken record. But they win and what happens? Nothing. A lot of feelings were had and nobody's any better or any worse. Part of what makes Amuse Mastery a wonderful uh, compliment to broken record is you don't sweat things if there's nothing to gain by you acting on them. Again, assertive right, remember, what is it, nine or 10? Like, I don't care. You just don't care. And that's amuse mastery, your assertive right to not care. When you use broken record, it's because it's something that you can change, it's something that you care about, and it's something you have the soft or hard power to influence. So when we're talking about these things, I don't want anybody to think that it's a magic wand that it gets you into and out of every situation by being more alpha. That's not how it works. And as much as all the bravado laden accounts on Twitter or YouTube talk about what an alpha male would do, I guarantee they've either never been in a position against somebody who's got hard power over them, or they have, and they probably have a bunch of records and warrants out on them. Either way, it's really crappy advice. There's a reason why that kind of bravado stuff only works with like the under 30 crowd, because by that time, Guys have run up against hard power a couple times in their life, and so they understand the idea of tactical boundary enforcement. So if you learn nothing else from this and the persistence and broken record, learn how to apply it judiciously. Remember, if there's nothing in it for you, why are you wasting your time? And granted, this is coming from a guy who argues on the internet professionally, so like, I get it. None of us are perfect, but you know what? Learn from my mistake. Don't argue with people about wearing masks on the internet. <laughs> Uh, anyways, hey guys, so this one's a shorter episode. We're almost done here. Thanks for sticking it out. It looks like the streams managed to stay up the entire time, which is awesome. Don't forget, by the way, uh, like button, subscribe. We've actually had a huge chunk of subscribers coming in the last little bit, so deeply humbled. Thank you guys for putting your faith in me to entertain and inform you over here over the next uh, God knows how many years I'm doing this. But again, show me the support. Show me the likes. It makes a huge difference, and it lets me know that I'm definitely on track on delivering real value to you guys. Uh, so next part is there are also situations that no matter how assertively and persistent you are, you are going to lose. You are not going to achieve your material goal. No set of skills or procedures can guarantee 100% success in getting what you want in every situation. To be specific, failure is more likely in situations where you try to use systematic assertive techniques especially in commercial and formal interactions to renegotiate a priori structures. All this means is that 
If you're negotiating with something in a, in a corporate environment or a formal business environment, broken record's not there and that's not going to help you. The idea there, and I hate to say it, but like boundary enforcement to not get hoodwinked is good, but you can't use it as an offensive tool to get what you want. So now that we've put all this aside, and that's it for the chapter, there's a couple other points that I want to map to this so that way guys are better able to articulate this. Because, yeah, for, I mean, from a single guy understanding boundaries, your walk away point, that stuff's all well and good. But let's tie it into parenting strategies. I referenced, I can't remember if it was this series or the No More Mr. Nice Guy. There was a great Last Psychologist article about Tiger Mom. And the idea of the girl that's abs, like there was a, excuse me, there was two guys, there's two people. There was a guy who beat his kids mercilessly and he wanted them to succeed and he sacrificed a lot for them. And they used that to contra, contrapose against this lawyer from New York City that was a second generation immigrant from China. She had that same tiger mom attitudes and she was using this example of how they were bad at it and she was good at it. Essentially, man is hard parent is bad, good woman is hard parent is good. The things that were different though, for the guy, it was always consistent. Now, I'm not suggesting that, you know, corporal punishment is good for raising kids, not at all. I'm not knowledgeable enough to say that one way or the other, but my gut instinct tells me you probably don't need it. But because he was consistent, the kids always knew what the problem was. It was always about performing, getting better grades, getting into a good school, making sure that when he worked 16 hours a day in a laundromat to be able to pay for them to go to do these things, that they weren't wasting his time and they weren't wasting their time. The fact that it was consistent meant the kids were able to build good mental models around it. So in other words, their, their child, transactional analysis, they were built on the feelings of disappointment. Can't do this, it'll disappoint my dad. They don't remember the physicality of it. All they remember is the emotion of disappointment and, and hurt. It was not angry. It was dispassionate. Um, from the parent side of the transactional analysis, they see it as that hard but fair attitude. And it's one of the ones, my teaching style in the military was that. I was extremely lenient, but I expected like the absolute best from everybody around me. I'm like, I'm putting in 100%. I expect at least 95 from you. Ended up being very hard, very difficult, but it always confused them the first time because... The one time when they actually did screw up, I wasn't angry or hard ass like I used to be. I actually got very soft, very quiet, very calm, and just went through the motions there. And it, apparently a lot of the guys came back after, like during course parties and that, like, dude, that messed me up more than anything you've ever yelled at me for in the class. And I was like, yeah, it's supposed to. I really was disappointed in you. So then they understand. And then from your parental model, you see it's that hard but fair. And then you eventually develop into adult skill sets, which where you don't even have to do any of this theater. But when you're in a situation when you're dealing with women and you're dealing with children, a lot of them just don't have the development capabilities or experience yet to be able to handle these things on an adult level. And so sometimes you have to adopt these more parental type strategies. Now, when I say consistency, there's a reason for it. Without consistency, your boundaries are way more difficult to enforce. An example for you. My dog, Hitchens, he can get up on my counters and reach about four or five inches in. So if I leave food within five inches of the edge of the counter, he can steal it when we're sleeping. And he always will. So one time out of, we always put the stuff in behind. He never can reach it. He tries, but he can't reach it. We catch him, we tell him no, we tell him to get down. But there's that one time out of a hundred attempts that he actually manages to get something. Steals a loaf of bread or steals a sandwich or steals that piece of cheese we had just too close on the cutting board. And that one time out of 100 empowers him to do this again forever. Like I'm never going to be able to train an atom because we just have not had that ruthless level of consistency to never make a mistake on this. And that's, you know, it's a failure as a dog owner on my part. I'll own that. Again, nobody's perfect. A lot of this boundary enforcement is the same thing. Like if you buckle one time out of every four... Well, then the next three times you have to enforce a boundary, but you have to be assertive, you have to use broken record, you're actually going to get worse behavior. It's something we always tell guys, like it's going to get worse before it gets better. Why? Because you've buckled on your boundary so many times that they think, well, if this doesn't work, I'm just going to amp up my crappy behavior and then that'll work. They always keep trying. They double down. So for the guys, they find the hardest time to learn to run their map to run dread and to enforce their boundaries is early on because it has not been established that if you're an authority, you're an assertive person and that it just seems like an act. 
It's like I said earlier, they always think you're a piece of shit. So they always think you're going to be butt mad. So just get past that. Just realize that consistency matters much more at the beginning. A lot of guys will find that. So once you get it, and sometimes you'll get to something called the main event, and I'll discuss that in a different episode, but you get to that point in a relationship, they'll notice these things all of a sudden become remarkably easy. And they're going, did I just become like super alpha man? Because now all of a sudden boundaries are easy to enforce. It's like, no, you've just established your boundaries. And so they're being tested less. It's kind of like Atlas. Don't ask me for a heavier load or don't ask me for a lighter load. Just ask for stronger shoulders. In that case, it's just, I just need more reps. Once they know it's going to happen all the time, it's going to happen all the time and they fight less. And this is where you're going to notice you're in a good red pilled male dominated relationship when nagging, whining, getting angry, all these things start to dwindle. You'll get them a lot less. Now you're not going to get rid of them. Girls are still emotional creatures. And part of it is managing those emotions in a proactive way, like I've discussed before, manufactured outrage, whatever. But you'll notice the volume is turned down on them. And a lot of the times when you, sometimes just an errant eyebrow or a that's not on, or just a small statement like that can like establish and snap people out of it. Snap people out of their unconscious mental models, their childlike behavior against you, thinking you're gonna respond as a parent. Instead, it's just like an adult. Dude, we're not children here, come on. You know what I mean? So that's broken record in a nutshell with a whole bunch of exterior stuff surrounding it. I think it's a, a great read and a great chapter on this topic. We're going to get to the next one probably, I guess, tomorrow because tomorrow's Patreon. By the way, if you guys haven't yet, got a Patreon community. Link to that's in the description. Come check it out. Every week we spend a couple hours on field reports, private time together. We take off the filter and we talk to each other just as men. You guys send in your field reports and for those that end up being paid members which i've got to get you guys access to now so once you've done it for like three weeks or whatever beginning of the month comes around everybody becomes a paid member and then i give you access to our locker room forums which is like a private discreet space where guys can talk about this stuff without a filter i would hate for somebody to get banned off of social media like facebook doesn't even allow this stuff anymore so there's really not many places that guys can talk about it so i like to think it's nice that we can add those Anyways, I see a lot of you guys in chat here. Sorry I didn't get a chance to chit chat with you more. These things are a little more structured, but don't worry, we'll make it up to you. <laughs> um, NL Wilson, is this a safe space? Well, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna rob you, so I think you can consider yourself safe for that. Um, I don't coddle people. I don't worry about feelings, but uh, as long as you're willing to learn and as long as you're willing to shut aside your ego, I think you're gonna find great value at this place. I wouldn't be doing it if I didn't. Again, shout out to Shadi Ramadan. Thank you for the $2 super chat. Just started listening recently. Love the content. Thank you. Oh, dude, you've got a huge binge watching experience to go through now. Wait till you get to the cooking videos, man. Anyways, guys, I'll check you on the next one. Uh, don't forget, Saturday, red morning, we're going to have uh, S-Curve Much back on again. It's going to be a good time. We're going to talk about dying alone. And I can't remember who's hosting Rule Zero. So you'll have to... You'll have to stay tuned. Follow us on Twitter. We'll find out then and there. I think it might be Rich this time. Possibly Rolo. Maybe it's Troy. I don't know. You tell me. Anyways, I'll catch you guys in the next one.